We are now headed to the Beamish Museum, and we've heard such wonderful things about this museum, this living museum. We can't wait to go check it out. Stay tuned for the best living museum in Britain, the best fish and chips I've eaten, some adorable farm animals, loads of history and vintage vibes, and at the end, a pub dinner at a place with a truly great name. We just arrived at the Beamish and the first thing we're going to do is try and take this tram to the 1950s town. One thing about Beamish is that there are trams and buses to help you move around the museum from one area to another. Since it is so massive, spanning about 375 acres. As it is, it takes one or two days to really see the Beamish Museum, and it would take a week if you had to walk it all on foot. As someone who spent my 30-year career doing marketing and advertising, of course I enjoy perusing all the vintage adverts on display at Beamish. And here's some clever headline writing here. Tudor potato crisps are very good. Wow, that's persuasive. Are you familiar with all of these brands? Do you remember any of these adverts? This is one of my favorites. If you want to get ahead, Get a hat. Ask your girlfriend. Operal prevents that sinking feeling. If you missed my Bovril taste test with Ian, we did it in the same video where we tasted Marmite and Vegemite. It's very funny, so check that one out. I'll link in the description. Care is taken with all the details of the construction here at Beamish, down to the drain pipes and the window glass. All the glass used is original, which is why it is kind of wavy looking. I love that the hairstylist is in there styling the hair of a real client into an authentic 1950s hairdo. There's a really fun ice cream shop in the town, which has table service and an assortment of lunch, foods, and snacks. But the reason we came straight to the 1950s town is for the chippy. I've been wanting to go there ever since I first heard about it last spring when it opened. I'm starving, so let's get to that lunch. Very appropriate tagline. What is worth eating is worth waiting for because the queue is very long. In addition to freshly cooked fish and chips, there was a good assortment of old timey beverages, including fizzy drinks and some delicious Harrogate water from here in the north. We have the beautiful fish and chips here at the Beamish and this is, this is a regular order of fish and chips, which means two massive pieces of fish. There's no tomato ketchup, so Ian's having a bit of a crisis. Mm. But there was malt vinegar, and it's delicious. This is delicious. The batter is different. It's, it's from the 1950s. Mm, it's That's the difference. It's 1950s batter. Okay, now I'm going to try a chip here. Oh, the chips are really nice and golden, not these anemic chips that we've been eating lately. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Two thumbs up. If I had two thumbs to hold up, I would use two thumbs up. So, the queue was long and we had to wait a while, but was the food worth it? Was the tagline on the front of the shop right? Yes, I believe it was. That was some of the crispiest and tastiest fish and most deliciously perfect chips I think I've had. The batter was amazing, the chips were truly golden brown and properly cooked, and serving in a paper cone with the fish on top helped keep the fish its crispiest. If you've eaten fish and chips served from real newsprint, let me know in the comments below. 
This town is set in the year 1913, before the start of World War I. It's probably the most popular and entertaining area in the Beamish Museum, though each have their own delightful surprises and discoveries and opportunities to learn about bygone eras. The bandstand here in the park reminds me of the lovely bandstand we saw in our video of Tenby Wales. A team of archivists and historians at Beamish work hard to ensure historical accuracy down to the tiniest detail wherever possible. Ian and I just noticed this place across the street and because of the icons on the top, we know it is a Masonic Lodge. So what do we know about this building? Where did it come from? They're all local. Everything that's built within Beamish is from the sort of northeast area, so that includes County Durham, Newcastle, Gateshead, uh, very occasionally down also sort of the, the bit of North Yorkshire, uh, and Weirdale that touched the neighbouring county. Hardcastle's Lung Strengthener, original balm of Gilead. This is a copy of an actual period building in the city of Durham. Even the cash register, aka till, is elaborate because back then people were fancy. All right, so we've got some Bisto, which I've been calling Bisto this whole time, like I'm Italian until some Briton corrected me. Oh, there's some marrow fat peas for making mushy, also mushy peas. And then look what's here, Cheshire cheese. Oh, that's a good taste test video if you haven't seen it yet, check out the link in the description. If you're a fan of Coleman's mustard, look at this. I didn't know that Coleman's made starch as well as mustard. And another thing I really love about the museum is that as a living museum, they try to demonstrate activities, but also produce real products and services like the bakery, which makes real bread and other baked goods available for purchase. And the confectioner, who is producing sweets you can buy. That is a hot job I'd not want to be doing during a summer heat wave. I saw this sign and hoped I might be able to try Fry's chocolate, but not today. They actually only sell their special brand of Jubilee chocolate at Beamish. Kind of fun since this year is a Jubilee year, as well as the year shown in this town, 1913. Okay, I know this stuff as honeycomb down south, and here in the north it's called cinder toffee. In Scotland, it's called puff candy. Somewhere else, it's called hokey pokey. Please let me know in the comments if you know whereabouts that is. Here is the candy factory where they are making lovely candy. Oh my goodness, that looks like a very hot job boiling the candy. Oh my goodness, it's a little hard to breathe in here. <coughs> the mixer, wow, this is just incredible. You should be glad to know that the dentist in the Edwardian period village is not doing dental surgery. After hearing about what those dentist visits were like in the early 1900s, I think we should all be very glad that dentistry has made major advances in the last hundred years. Here's a Edwardian bathroom. So if we want to renovate our flat bathroom back to its original time period. Here's what we need to do, Ian. Wow, look at that toilet. Oh, look at the shower. Looks like quite the contraption. It's just so wonderful to walk through here and imagine life in the time period that is depicted in each one of these rooms.
so when I went to Ripon, I made a comment about how the garage there looked like the one from the Downton Abbey movie. But guess what? This actually is the garage used in the Downton Abbey movie. This one here in the 1913 town at the Beamish. We're going to visit the dentist between visiting the chocolate shop and the ice cream. Says up there, dental surgery. You probably eat very little fiber in your diet. So you have digestive problems, probably with things like hemorrhoids, which might come in. Um, rotten teeth because you have loads of sugar. If, if you wanted to show that you're really, really wealthy, you'd have an entire meal spread up your table made from sugar. So you'd have a sugar turkey, a sugar loaf of bread. Everything was made out of sugar, literally. Um, dental hygiene was pretty poor with most people. Poor person, it's their toothbrush if they had one at all, which is a bit of cork. Um, and you rub salt around your teeth or perhaps a bit of soot from the back of the fire. <laughs> So, the if you were to you would get a, a, a nice expensive toothbrush like that, which is a bone handle with pig's bristles in. Um, and there's one particular area of the pig that makes nice bristles, but I won't tell you where it comes from. Um, but they're quite soft, and it's very much like a modern toothbrush, actually. But that might be the family toothbrush. Wow. Ooh, they're making some dentures in here. People pretty much only went to the dentist once or twice in their life. Most typically, by the time they were about 30, they would be in terrible pain. They would go to the dentist. He would extract all of their teeth and fit them for dentures. They have some surprisingly delicious ice cream that's made here for the Beamish Museum with an assortment of fantastic flavors. And we've arrived at the ice cream stand, which is, of course, Ian's goal, having some ice cream. Ian ordered the chocolate fudge, our friend got the cinder toffee, and I ordered the rhubarb and custard. Not only because it was a kind of magenta, but also because I'm obsessed with rhubarb. And I'm always banging on to my friend who has a cooking channel here on YouTube called Rhubarb and Cod, that she needs to do a rhubarb crumble and custard recipe video. Just consider this shout out further harassment from me, Susan. It's so wonderful wandering here because you really do feel like you are in an authentic English village, not a replica. Here's obviously another original building. 1891 Beamish School Board. Playing with a hoop and a stick. Oh, look, Dara, separate taps. Oh, no. They did have it rough back in the 1913 time period. Was this moved here or was this? Yeah, yeah. And everything on the side, well, on the small, on the top of the hill, on the house, the real property, everything else was brought here. The manor house has always been here, dates back to the 1400s. And the farm was the part of this area before the museum took it over. Oh, wow. It opened 52 years ago. It's fascinating reading about consumption, the things to do to safeguard. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> how the germs of consumption are carried from the sick to the well. Give us a bite of your apple. <laughs> Putting food, money, pencils, etc., into the mouth after a consumption has poisoned them with his spit. And please, no spitting on the floor. True in 1913 and still good advice for 2022. And there's even a Methodist church here in Pitt Hill. But we're going to go down into the pit mine now. We are going to check out the mine now. This mine is really amazing to see. So here's the coal. 
and the train carts that would have carted the coal. So of course, I grew up in Illinois with a father who was a fisherman. So to me, bait is stuff you use to catch fish. I didn't realize that the sinker's bait cabin is the place where miners got their lunch for the day because just like the Cornish miners would have pasties up north, they'd take their sandwich in their bait kit for the day. That's the, your bait, it's your lunch. Okay, we come in here to get our hats and our lanterns before we go into the mine. Oh, no magenta hats, I'll have to take a red one. After wandering all over the mining area looking for where we entered the drift, we finally found it, but not soon enough. Once again, bad luck. I got here to the drift so I could go check it out from the inside and we arrived just as they were closing up after the last tour. So it's been a little bit disappointing day between <laughs> <laughs> the cathedral and the castle and now the mine, but at least we really enjoyed the rest of the Beamish. But my tiny inconvenience of not being able to go into the drift mine is nothing compared to the real life tragedy of so many miners who lost their lives in such a dangerous profession, including in 1909, the 168 Durham miners who lost their lives in this colliery explosion. Need kindly light amid the encircling gloom lead thou me on The night is dark and I We had to visit the 1940s home farm before leaving Beamish so we could see our friend Farmer Carl. He was very busy on the tractor, so we had a chat with the farm animals and a look around. Roosters don't like me, so I'm very glad I'm on the other side of a fence right now. Hey, wait a minute. Did you escape? You don't belong on this side of the fence. <laughs> Hello. Look at all these geese and ducks. This is awesome. Then we chose to take on the duck rescue mission of getting this little guy back on the right side of the fence. Come on. No, just go. Let Ian help you over, you silly duck. Of course, I failed to film the dramatic moment when Ian succeeded in catching the duck and tossing him over the fence. I think it's pretty funny that Ian caught the duck and put it back in the pen. Nelly the pig. Isn't she a beaut? Hey, Nelly. Nelly. Nelly's more interested in the ducks. She won't show me her face. Come on. Let me see your face. Oh, there you are. Hello, pretty girl. Feeding time, the most exciting part of the day. Oh, this is adorable. They are so excited. Pretty Tamworth pig. You're a petite thing com compared to oh, Nelly. Nelly, Nelly across the road. 
the house is original and then the stable yard police did a lot of work so when people struck it on they did a lot of restoration work this is a horse stable this is where they poop so it goes into the oh my sort of goodness ditch. It's uh, the, the cow sewer. The feed comes straight in from it says, so you just kick your hay down into uh -huh. the troughs. And then they have these uh, chains that go around their necks, so they come through here, so they move. It means they can move around and lie down and stand up. It just means that they can't catch other cows with their horns and hurt other cows. Or... So the cow buyer is where they're fed and... Yeah, and off. And then have their little sewer system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, are you coming to say hi? Very expressive ears. Oh, that curly tail is so cute. It's very nice to finally meet Vera and Lynn. Because I'm a huge fan of the show, Vera, here's what I'm going to do, pet. I'm going to pretend that the Vera pig is named after Detective Chief Inspector Vera Stanhope from the Northumberland and City Police. Even though these pigs are really named after Vera Lynn, the famous singer from the 1940s. This is the Netty, a.k.a. Outhouse. We decided to have dinner down the pub, as they say up north, with our friends Shannon and Carl. Shannon chose a pub that had a really fantastic name. You'll be relieved to hear that there were no owls nor otters on the menu, though. The food was delicious. So we highly recommend coming to the Owl and Otter in Dipton after you've spent a day at the Beamish. They had a really good variety of international items on the menu. We enjoyed fried camembert with red onion chutney, the Chinese chili chicken, yes, chili with two L's, but it was tasty nonetheless, and Ian ordered the Thai salmon, which was also delicious. And then, since Ian claimed he was too full for pudding, I ordered a plum and peach crumble with blueberries on top and custard on the side. So lush. Well, all in all, it's been a good day here in Durham, even though the castle was closed and the cathedral was closed. <laughs> and we arrived a bit too late at the mine. But other than that, it's been a fabulous day. Ian, what did you think of the Beamish Living Museum? It was amazing, yeah, it was. What surprised you about it? Uh, well, just the size of it and how spread out, spread out it is, and it seems like you're in the countryside mm -hmm. with just uh, little villages. Mm -hmm. We hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching, and do, do something, something good, good in, in the, the world, world today. today.